I want you to make it better. I want you to make it better. And the question is going to be, what if he never makes it better? See, I'm here. Praise the Lord. Okay, they're hallelujah. And they can you go, aren't you miserable? No, I'm really not. What do you have that I don't have? Don't shut down. Don't give up. Don't become bitter. Surround yourself with people who love Jesus. But I promise you that I think today you'll be really, really encouraged at the very end because I learned something I never even thought of. Okay, welcome. Welcome for those of you that are here and for those watching us online. Roku, any of the apps that you are watching us from, we are super glad that you are here with us. If you want to know more about our ministry, you can go to womensbiblestudy.com and on there you can get the handouts and watch past lessons and all of that. Also, we are going to ask everyone, if you do watch us from any of those venues, to please donate $5. We're trying to work on the iPhone app to get that handled. If you just go to womensbiblestudy.com, click on a reoccurring $5. That helps us. We're calling you a fiver er. fiver er. <laughs> You're a women's Bible study Five dollar donator, whatever that works. So, okay, Mother's Day. Everyone have a fun Mother's Day. Yes, my son, who is seventeen, uh, shocked me. He walked in the door with flowers and peanut M and M's, and I was like, "Oh, that's so cute." But I looked at him because I'm like, "How did you pay for this?" And he said, "I used your American Express." <laughs> <laughs> And then he said, no, that's not true. He said, I actually, because I told you last week about the whole um, uh, Andy Stanley money that we pay him, and he spent his money on me. So I was kind of thought that was really sweet. I know. All right, I told you last week that I'm, I, well, most of you know, I always tell you this, I'm, I'm like the worst grandmother ever. Uh, and so we never watch our kids. So our grandkids, apparently I don't watch our kids <laughs> either, but we don't watch our grandkids except once a year. That was two weeks ago. And so I want to um, tell you what I learned from that. Uh, I learned that I only want to do that once a year, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, here's what we realized. Here's our first picture. I don't know. So the first thing we realized is that you have to rent something that has water. So I don't even know. If that we, okay, a slide. Look at that. So we rented a little water slide, and they had so much fun, and it kept them so busy. And by the time it was bedtime, night-night, they were really super tired. And then the, the, this is the next thing you have to have if you're going to do things with kids. You have to have women's Bible study. You have to have pizza. Okay, so you feed them lots of pizza. And then the next thing you have to do is make sure that you feed them as much junk food as possible and give them a good TV program. Okay, so you should see all the food. It's like, uh, what, what is there? Animal cookies and and fruit by the foot, and like we had all this stuff sitting there. And I realized that I want to be the really cool grandma. So they'd be like, oh, Mona Lee, can we have more? Absolutely. Anything you want to have, because their parents can say no, but I want to be the grandma that says yes to everything. Okay. <laughs> here is what, oh, here and then, Ra, there uh, we have eight. We're getting ready to have our ninth. I know. Um, but only seven of them were there. So that was, that was good. And then the last picture, we have little Rob, or my husband Rob, he, he was playing golf with them. I don't know if that's going to show up or not. Uh, anyway, he was, he was goofing around playing golf with the kids. It was super fun. Anyway, this is what I learned about little children that I had forgotten. One, you can never go to the bathroom, okay? Like there's no time to go, because you, you can't like run into the bathroom because they're going to get into something. And so I f had forgotten that. So you have to actually you know, have someone watch the kids while you're running, which is so weird to say at Bible study. I get that. Um, then the second thing I realized is time goes by so slow. I, I know that. So, like, we get up in the morning, and it's, it's like, I hit the first one I hear is the 6.45, and I'm like, oh, for the love, it's going to be a long day. And so we go in, we're like, okay, let's get up. And then it's breakfast. I'm thinking, well, that should take an hour. So it's 7 o'clock. Rob's making bacon. I'm making pancakes. We look at the clock when they're all done. It's like, 7.15. And I'm like, now what do we do with them? So I'm like, hey, let's color. Okay, so they colored. Then we sent them outside, and Rob and I are sitting there. And I said, what time is it? Thinking it's got to be 10. 8.15. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is going to be a super, super long day. So anyway, my, my granddaughter, or my, my daughter-in-law called, and she said, you had so much fun with the kids, which we did. Um, and she said, do you want to do that every month? <laughs> no way. Now, last week, um, I w most of you, I like to get here early, and we set up, and then I go get dressed, and then hopefully come in here because I want to, like, say hi to you. But 
um, last week I didn't do that because I was actually sick last week. Some of you, I told you this. I woke up the night, like Tuesday night, with the flu. And I was so nauseated, and I kept thinking, I don't know how I'm going to make it today. So I didn't want to give you the flu, but my daughter-in-law called. Or no, somebody, Patty, you called, or you texted me, and you said, maybe you got this bug from your grandkids. And I said, there's reason number whatever that I should never watch my grandchildren. See, it had to have come from them. So I decided, along with being the worst grandmother, that I'm the worst mother. So Cheyenne's home from college now, Dusty's. And, and she comes home, and she's like, could we maybe get some food in this house? <laughs> I'm like, seriously? And she goes, we need pickles. I can't remember if I told you this. I said, you're 20, almost 20 years old. Go get your own pickles and bring them home, okay? And Dusty's wandering in the house going, do we have food in here? But they're never home. And I don't cook because they never are home. She's doing her own thing and, and Dusty's playing basketball and whatever he's doing. I, so we don't, I don't cook. So I realized that I'm like the worst mother too. Then I realized I'm the worst dog owner, too. So here's Pogo. Here's a picture of our little bratty dog, Pogo. Well, maybe. So when we have the kids, oh, anyway, Pogo's a little white bratty dog, and we're kind of scared to have him around the grandkids. So we decided to put him in a pet hotel. Thursday night for Friday. Okay, so Thursday night, I'm like, oh, I need a pet hotel. We find one. They're like, well, he needs shots. Oh, he doesn't have his shots because I'm a p terrible dog person. So I had to go around and try to find shots in the morning, okay? Well, I, I, you have to have a collar. Okay, well, I don't know where his collar is because I'm the worst dog owner. So I find a collar, but it's about four sizes too big for him. And then it keeps slipping off them, but I can't find a leash now. So I, so I, bought so I found some ribbon at the house and I made my own leash. And I look like the tackiest person you've ever met in your life. So apparently I'm not good at much of anything. How's that? Okay. We were so funny when we got there. We said, uh, we called them. We said, hey, we need our dog to come and spend the night. And they said, well, how many nights? <laughs> I'm like, how much for forever? <laughs> Aw, we love our dog. We did pick him up. Rob goes, what if we give him a fake number? Like a fake, you know, and when they try to call us to pick him up, we're just like, they can't find us now. He's back home, don't worry. Okay, today let's talk Bible. We are on part two of a very, very, very serious subject called How Do I Know For Sure That I Am Really Truly A Follower Of Christ, A Christian, but we're using a different word. We are using rockets as an example for this because um, what we realize is that what we learned last week is the word Christian was never ever used in the time of Jesus. He never called his followers Christians. He called them something else. Um, he called them disciples. And so that's what we're trying to say because I, I saw, uh, last night I was watching the news and they did this, if you watch news you saw this, they did a, a Pew poll and uh, seven years ago there was 79% of all Americans who said they were Christians. And this poll seven years later taken, you know, this recently said 70% it's gone down, 70% uh, of all people in America would consider themselves Christians. Now, the question that we want to ask is, is that a possibility? Like, I would think that the United States would be a completely different place if, in fact, 70% of all the people stood up for Jesus and said, we will not go along with the culture on this or that or whatever's going on here. So Jesus uh, called his, uh, the people following him disciples. And so what we talked about last week are two rockets. So this rocket here we look at, it's somebody who would consider themselves or call themselves a Christian. Uh, we call it Americanized Christianity. Somebody that maybe said, hey, I asked Jesus in my heart when I was five. I got baptized. I, I, um, I go to church Christmas and Easter. Uh, my parents were Christians, I live in America, whatever that looks like. Um, but this particular rocket or this particular person looks from the outside like it's a rocket. It's even at the right place. It's at Cape Canaveral where rockets do take off. So it could be that you, you know, maybe show up at church. But what we learned last week is, is that person might not really truly ever know for sure that they're a follower of Christ because something has to be going on inside of them. And we talked about this particular rocket looks like a disciple of Jesus because there's something going on inside of them that's moving them, that's, that's, they're learning, they're growing, they're sharing their faith, they're doing all the things that a disciple would do, not an American Christian. And so that's how we are going to know for sure that we truly, truly are 
saved and, and, and eternity is, will be spent in heaven, and that is when we um, understand what this word disciple means. And a disciple is somebody we learn that abides in Christ. You spend time with him. You read his word. You're, you're desperate to know everything you can about him. Uh, you love to go to church. You love to learn about him. You, re- you read books. You're, whatever it is, you just want, to, you want this relationship with him. And because of that, you're growing up in your faith. And what happens is he produces what we called last week fruit. And we went over and talked about that last week. Now, I loved, loved, loved Kristen Anderson being here the week before we started this. She was our suicide survivor. And I loved where where she talked about how all of her life she went to church and she really honestly thought that she was a Christian, Americanized Christianity. Um, Her parents went to church. And when she tried to kill herself, and of course, God saved her from that horrific nightmare, Uh, What we learned is that when she lost both of her legs, and if you were here, uh, the first time she went back to church, some lady randomly just walked up to her and said, had you died, you would have gone to hell. And that totally just terrified her. And she's like, what are you talking about? Because she was raised this way, and yet Jesus says to be his follower, it's this way. And somebody had the guts to say, what you've always believed is not true. And I think some of us here, that's a word for us today. We may have to go to our our kids or our, our husband or our family members or somebody and sit them down and say, I want you to know what the Bible says it means to be a true follower of, of Jesus. And so that's kind of where we're going today. Now, being a disciple, this is where we're going to, the first thing that we're going to learn today about being a disciple, which is this over here. And it's this whole idea that Jesus has to be your Savior and your Lord. Because somehow, Americanized Christianity has said, Jesus can just be your Savior. You just ask him in your heart, you get a free ticket to heaven, and you can live however you want. He doesn't have to be your boss, your Lord. He can just be your Savior. So invite him in your heart as your Savior. And I will tell you, that is not a biblical concept at all. Like when you become a disciple, Jesus has to become your Lord. The problem is people want the perks. This kind of a person over here says, well, I, I want to go to church. I want to look like a Christian. I want to pray. I want Jesus to answer my prayers. Um, I want him to make me successful. And if, you know, in, in, uh, in response to that, I will show up at church and maybe give you a 20 bucks in the offering plate, God. And it's kind of this bartering system here. But Jesus comes along and says, yeah, let me give you a little clue. That doesn't work. That, that's not even how Jesus ever says that it means to be a follower. Look at Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, that's our word, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interest, take up his cross and follow me, cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying. In other words, Jesus comes along and said, if you want to be my disciple, your life is no longer yours. It's not about you any longer. Now we have to move to his agenda and what he says is truth and what he says, uh, what he wants from our life. Now, here's our problem. And I'm going to use homosexuality as an illustration only because it's a huge hot topic right now. All these states are coming in saying, you know, we want to legalize gay marriage and we want to do all of these kind of things. And... And so the problem is, is that so many churches are now saying, homosexuality is fine. Come to church. We accept you. Okay. As so many people um, are are pastors saying, I'm gay, but I I have a a church. Come on over. And, And my question is, is can a follower, a disciple of Jesus be, be gay? I mean, what does the Bible say about that? And I know that's very harsh, but I think at some point we need to stand up and say, what does the Bible say a true disciple of Jesus means? So we're going we're gonna to find some verses on that. But uh, this whole idea of giving up your, yourself. Uh, I was talking to a lady one day. She went to a meeting. And at this meeting, she ha- there was lots of different people, and they were getting up and sharing their stories. And one guy who was clearly had... He looked, uh, he probably talked a little gay. He probably, you know, and your first reaction when you spoke to him was that he probably is living a gay lifestyle. Um, But he got up in front of these people and he said, I am pretty sure that I am gay. He said, but because I am a follower, a disciple of Jesus, I cannot act on those feelings. I can't do it. 
And that is what a disciple does. It says, you know what? Jesus is my Lord. Whatever he says goes. It's not like I can make up my own rules. And that's very difficult in this day and age because we're, we're told we need to be tolerant. To be. This is nothing to do with tolerant. Okay, this has everything to do with, we love people and we should love people. But what it has to do with is standing up and saying, Jesus, if you are my Lord, that means I cannot live in a lifestyle that you absolutely do not agree with. And, and I'm just not, I'm not even talking about homosexuality by itself. We're talking adultery. We're talking, you know, people who are here and you're sleeping with your boyfriends or having an affair, whatever it is. Jesus says, those are not conducive to somebody who is my disciple that makes Jesus Lord of his life. And if we're going to be a disciple, that's what he calls us to do. He has to be our Lord. Now look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in, and he gives us a list, sexual sin, worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. See, the Bible tells us exactly what it means for Jesus to be Lord of our life. The problem is we don't want to listen to him. We want to do what we want to do, and no one can tell me what to do is kind of what we're thinking. But being, having Jesus be the Lord of their life says, I'm going to read my Bible, and whatever it says, Jesus is my boss on whatever he says. I thought about this. We have our, our dog, Bitsy. She's kind of a tall dog. When she jumps up on our bed, uh, she thinks that she like, wants to take the whole bed. And so we're trying to teach her you can't get on the bed. So the other day, she goes, jumps in the pool, comes running in the house, and she jumps on my bed. Now, I usually say, get down. But when I get, say get down, she literally just lays down. So she thinks get down means I'm just going to lay down on the bed. I have to say, get down off the bed, and then she jumps off the bed. So it's kind of like what Jesus does. Like he gives us very, very, he didn't just say, yeah, I just don't do bad things. He says, look, if you're going to be a follower of mine, these, these are the instruction manual. Like I created man and woman to be like married. And like I didn't create all this other goofy stuff that's going on in America right now. And we as disciples of Christ have to stand up and say, we're not going for that anymore. We're not going to be tolerant. Like we're going to love you. And we're going to pray for you. But it has nothing to do with, with tolerance. Okay, so we got to get that out. Ah. We have to say that being Jesus, being Lord, is, is, is denying what we want in light of living how he created us to be. J.D. Greer, oh, I meant to bring you that book. It's a little book last week we talked about. Uh, he wrote a book called um, uh, Stop Asking Jesus in Your Heart. It's a great little book. He says this. He says, repentance is asking that Jesus is Lord of everything as a matter of who he is. Whatever your disagreement with Jesus, he is right and you are wrong. Be that your position on abortion, sex before marriage, homosexuality, generosity, or anything else. Jesus is Lord. Now, I will tell you a few weeks ago, uh, Bruce Jenner had his, uh, the thing on TV because he uh, apparently thinks that he wants to be a woman, so he's doing the whole transgender thing, whatever. That particular week, we saw a lot of shows on this whole transgender now it's kind of coming out and if you're I guess if your child wants to be a boy and he's really a girl you let him be a boy I, I I don't really get it but I will tell you that I cried for two days because I saw on Facebook where people who would who I know claim to be Christians were writing things like way to go Bruce glad that you're glad you're just being who you think you are and these are people who say they're Christians. And then other Christians would comment, we need to be more tolerant as Christians. We, and I was sick. I, was, I, I cried, I cried, I came in here. I, I couldn't even, like Chris and Jane always pray with me in the morning. I couldn't even talk to them. Like I was blow drying my eyes in the bathroom before I got here. Because for some reason it hit me so hard. I'm thinking, what is wrong with our culture? And what is wrong with, with followers of Christ that we can just say, you know what? God creates man and God creates woman. And we can just tear up what he's made. I just don't get it. And it broke my heart. And thankfully, you know, I had, we had two girls that had stayed after, Chris and Sherilyn. And I mean, I, I, I walk, they walked around the corner. I'm just sobbing. <laughs> but it's something, I don't know why it affected me so much, but it's like I knew this series was coming up, and it, this is a big deal. If we are going to be disciples, we cannot go along with the culture. Look at what the New Living Translation says in Psalms 139. 
You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. English Standard Version, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. And can I tell you something? When God creates a man as a man, that's what you're supposed to be. And when God creates a woman, that's what you're supposed to be. And it's not like that I don't love Bruce Jenner. I am so sad for him. My daughter said she watched it, and she said, Mom, he actually got up on national TV and said, I go to church and I'm a Christian. And I sat back and said, how is that possible? But all of the people that say they're Christians were like, go, Bruce. And I think we should pray for Bruce because Bruce is clearly missing something in his life. It's like he, Jesus never... When he met with people, he never sat around and said, you know what, you just go and do what you want to do. The, the woman at the well, let's just say, she had five husbands and she was living with this guy. And Jesus never said, you know what, hey, do whatever you want to do. He said, I'm the living water. You need to come to me and I will give you everything you want. Bruce is missing Jesus, a relationship with Jesus in his life. And if he came to that conclusion, then he could have Jesus be his Lord and say, God, you created me a man and I need to live like you created me. It's so simple, but in this culture, it's just crashing. And we need people who will stand up and say, I cannot tolerate that, but I will pray for Bruce and I will love him. And we need to all put Bruce on our prayer list and say, God, save him because he needs something and he's stretching for all these other things. But it's like people go, well, well, that's not really fair, Lisa, because he was probably born with that. Well, you know what? A lot of you are born with the propensity to be an alcohol, alcoholic. Some of you have the propensity to drugs. Maybe your family, maybe it's in your line. But you know what? It's a choice. At some point when you decide that Jesus is going to be Lord of your life, you say, I'm done. I can't do those things that I want to do anymore because he is now my boss. And this kid gave me the, the most wonderful illustration when he got up and said, I think I'm gay, but I cannot live that lifestyle because Jesus is my Lord. It's a whole new ball game when Jesus is our Lord instead of just our Savior. Satan is the greatest deceiver. And Satan is taking what, what God has made normal and just twisting it just a little bit. Think of the word family. Family used to be just a mom and a dad and, and a couple kids. Now look at the word family. Satan has taken it and twisted it. Now family means what? Women, women with kids, men, men. We, I, just never, I never watched the um, Arizona news. It was on last night. The very end, they showed a picture. Oh, today we have this beautiful song sung by, uh, I don't even know who, who sang it or where it even came from. And it showed a man and a man that just adopted their brand new baby. And on and, and, and TV on Arizona, and everyone's like, oh, that's so sweet. They're making something that God created, and, and Satan's twisting it and making it normal. And we have got to say, enough's enough. Now, I'm the worst at this. I will tell you this right now. I would love to call my congressman. I would have to Google who my congressman is, okay? Because I don't know, like, I'm just, I, I know that sounds horrible, and it's like, call your senator, and same thing. I don't even know who my senator is, but here's the problem with that, is that I don't do it, and I should. I should take a stand, because if, if all of the disciples of Jesus called our congressman and senator and said, absolutely not, we do not want gay marriage in, in our state. I don't do it. You know why? Because I don't think it's going to do any good. I think I'm going to be one voice, and there's thousands of groups. So why even bother, okay? But that's bad. That's shame on me. You know, I need to stand up for what, what, because if all of us as disciples of Jesus actually did that, think how this world would be changed. But, and I'm the worst. I will tell you that right now. So Jesus being Lord uh, doesn't mean we're being intolerant. This is what it means. We are coming up against a culture that is redefining what God has created as normal. Okay, We have to, as disciples of Jesus, come up against a culture that is redefining what God, our Creator, our Savior, our Lord, has, has, has made normal. Now it's, it's the, Satan's twisting it and making it not normal. And Jesus being Lord means we have to agree with what he says in his word. That's just what it is, and I can't make that any better. Okay, Because we got a lot of people over here. They're just going along with everything and showing up in church and thinking they're okay. And I'm telling you what, the Bible does not say that. And that, it terrifies me. So, from everything that we just read, can you, and you have to answer this for yourself, what does the Bible say? Can you live a homosexual lifestyle? Can you have affairs? Can you sleep with people? Can you, can you cheat, cheat people and, and steal from your boss and claim 
to be a disciple of Christ? I don't think so, but that's something you've got to ask yourself. I put these postcards over there when you walk out. Um, I made three of them. Here's one of them. Here's what I realized. To follow Jesus means to unfollow me. And, and, and you put it on your refrigerator. Stick it in your Bible. To follow Jesus means I can't follow me anymore. My life can't be about me. Whatever Jesus says, it has to go. Because being this Christian over here says no one's going to tell me what to do. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to obey with everything. The Bible says outdated book, but I'm going to show up at church and think I'm going to go to heaven. And over here, it says, you know what? Jesus is my Lord. And whatever he tells me, I have to go with and stand up for. Okay? And I'm saying, not to be jerks, okay? I'm not, I'm not against Bruce Jenner, and I'm not a, I love, I'm saddened. We, we went to New York last year, and I can't tell you the amount of people we saw walking down the street, men and men and women and women, and holding hands and hugging and kissing. And, and I, I was, my heart was broken because I thought, you're missing what Jesus offers. And that's what we need to stand up for. Now, one thing being Jesus, um, being a disciple also is this. It's this idea that Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you need to count the cost. Now, that's very difficult. I realized this in um, Africa. I know I've told you the story. It was the most impactful one to me when we were there. Went to Africa. Uh, these people have, you know, they walk miles and miles to get to church. It's this tin building. It's hot. Uh, it's dusty. It's dirty. They walk all this way to get there. Their church services are about two, two and a half hours long. Literally, they are, they're, they're worshiping, praising, crying, raising hands, listening to a sermon. They're just so overwhelmed by the grace of God. And I'm looking around like, this is like, ah, ah dusty and dirty and no food and no nothing. And here's the deal. We talk to the people. If you want to come to Christ, if you want to become a disciple of Jesus in Africa, this is what you had to do with this church. They don't even let you ask Jesus in your heart then. It's not like an altar call. It's like, if you want to know him, come back tomorrow. Take time out of your schedule and be here at 4 o'clock. You may even have to like, leave work a little early if you work. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to send you through a discipleship class. And you're going to find out what it means to be a follower of Christ. Because you have to count the cost before you even make this decision. And this is what they would tell them. You might be ostracized from your family. You may go back home and say, hey, I asked Jesus in my heart. And they may say, get out. And they want nothing to do with you ever again. You might never get a job because you're a follower of Jesus. You may be put to death. I mean, you know Africa. Africa's all over the board right now. You may be walking down the street and someone could say, are you a follower of Jesus? And you say yes, and they kill you on the spot. So now, do you want to be a follower of Jesus? If not, there's the door. Okay, so th they're telling people that there's a cost to following Christ. And I thought about this. We, we, have, um, we go to a very, very large church, and uh, they had a guest speaker. Most of you probably know him. Uh, Nick Vujicek, I think his name is. He's the guy, the man who has no arms and no legs. They brought him in to speak. He's an, an evangelist. He's got the greatest story. And he did an altar call at the very end. And I can't tell you the hundreds of people that went forward. Now, Please don't hear me. I think some people honestly did get saved in altar calls. So don't, don't hear me that I don't think that. But what if all the people standing up front, Nick sat down with them and said, before you decide to make this decision, let me ask you a few questions. Um, you might lose your job because tomorrow you're going to go back and tell your boss that you're a Christian and he may say, I don't, I don't like Christians and they're not working for me. Get out. And then you might lose your job and then because you lose your job, you can't pay your bills and now you're going to lose your home. And then guess what? You might lose that boat that's so precious to you. And then you know what? If you're a wife here and your husband hates God and now you go home and tell him you've become a, a follower of Jesus, he might divorce you. And you know what? Your kids, they, they think you're a nutcase because you just showed up at church. But now that you're going to become a full devoted follower of Christ, they might not want to have anything to do with you. And then someday you're going to be out sharing your faith, maybe at work, and, and a lawsuit maybe gets slapped upon you. And then you're going to be in the mall one time and you're going to be wearing your cross and maybe someone's going to come up with a gun and say, are you, are you a follower of Jesus? And you might get shot. Now, before you make this decision, before you decide that, you know, in front of all these people that you're going to come to Christ, what do you want to do? Because there's a cost to following Christ. There's not a cost to coming to him. He has paid for our sins. He's paid the penalty for our sins. So there's no cost in salvation. So please get that. But somewhere along the line, we're going to have to make a choice. 
Now, I love this. I've told you this illustration before, too. Uh, we live in a country where we're never, ever forced by any stretch of the means to, to follow, to, to, um, uh, we're never forced to uh, stand up for our faith like they are in, in like Africa and other places. But I think it was in Russia where they had, and this is my favorite illustration, they had an underground church where they were all, you know, having a church service and masked gunmen walked in the door and said, here's the deal, follower of Jesus, not. Here's your choice. Follower of Jesus, go over here. They know they're going to get shot. If you're not, run out the door. Half of them ran out the door, half of them went front. And as soon as they got the door shut, they locked the door. The guys took off the mask, put down their guns, and said, now let's have a church service. Okay. Now, we don't get that here, but that is how the majority of the world, like following Jesus is a big, big deal. But see, we don't get it here. Because we think Jesus asking him in our life just means uh, I get to go to heaven. And if I pray that Jesus will give me a Ferrari and a mansion, that he should. And that I just need to be happy. And, and, and he needs to make sure that that happens. And see, Jesus comes along. And read that verse again. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interest. Take up his cross, follow me, cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying also. Now, we're going to take a breather, because that was really heavy, <sighs> okay? So take a breath, and this is what I want to tell you. I think, for the most part, every one of us, I'm going to assume, never once counted the cost to follow Christ. And I will tell you, in, in America, most people don't. I didn't. I will tell you why I asked Jesus in my heart when I was seven at a vacation Bible school. It was because Mrs. Runyon told me that I would go to heaven, and it was because Mrs. Runyon would give me a Bible. And I knew that. And so therefore, I actually asked Jesus in my heart for two reasons. I wanted a Bible, and I wanted to go to heaven. Okay? So I w there was no, no one told me at seven years old that there was a, a, a counting a cost kind of a thing. But I think for most of us, that's what happens. But here's what you've got to realize, is that at some point, you're going to come face to face with the cost of following Christ. And it might be this, it might be your lifestyle. Just like this guy had to walk away from a lifestyle that he felt like he wanted to be in, it might cost you a lifestyle. It might cost you that thing that you want to do. You know you're not supposed to, you know it's not good for you, you know Jesus says no, not do it, but you really want to do it. And it might cost you by saying, no, I can't do that because I am a disciple. It might cost you that relationship. Some people here watching, you're living with that guy that, you, that isn't a Christian or isn't a follower of Christ. You're, you're dating that guy that's not a follower of Christ. You're sleeping with that guy, whatever it is. And it might cost you that time of saying, you know what, I have to walk away from this because Jesus is my Lord and I have to obey what he has to say. Some of you, it may cost you friends. It, it just does. You, your friends are on a track and they're drinking and doing stupid stuff and you're like, I just want to follow Christ. And sometimes you have to disengage from your friends so that you can continue on the path. That doesn't mean you don't love them, and that doesn't mean you don't pray for them and, you know, and try to impart good stuff. But sometimes you have to give up things like that, and that is a cost to following Jesus. Now, I think people in Jesus' day were just the exact same. Think about this. They heard about Jesus. He's this great healer. So if you were sick, you would go and hear him in hopes that he would heal you. He raises people from the dead. If you had just lost somebody close to you, you would have gone like, maybe if I get to Jesus, he can raise this person that I love from the dead. He fed people. If you were hungry, you're like, ah, free, free lunch. I'm going to listen to Jesus and he'll give me food. Calming, raging storms, the perfect person to go fishing with would be Jesus, okay? Um, so basically, who wouldn't want to follow Christ? Who wouldn't want to follow him back then? He does everything for you. And, and, and yet... This is what he said. He talks about in Luke 14, now large crowds. And I want to stop for a second because when they're talking large crowds, you have to realize that Jesus fed 5,000 and Jesus fed 4,000 men, which means 5,000 men plus maybe the wives and plus the kids. These crowds could be upwards of 15,000 people that are actually standing there. And Jesus is addressing this crowd. And look what he says. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot 
be my disciple. Um, and you can imagine at this particular time what Peter and John were thinking. They're looking at Jesus and they're saying, whoa, 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 Jesus. Like, why are you telling people that they have to hate their mother, father, brother, sister? Like, that's difficult. And that's hard. And by the way, Jesus, you're kind of like the Justin Bieber of Jerusalem. And we're kind of like the Justin Bieber's bodyguards of Jerusalem. And we're kind of really popular. And you're kind of popular. And look at all these 15,000 crowds. Jesus, calm it down just a little bit. Because here's the deal. You're going to lose those people. They're not going to follow you. You've got this great following. And then Jesus continues on. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, when he wants to build the tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost um, and, uh, to see if, it is, if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it began to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he's strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So, then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his possessions. Now, with that, we're all just like, <gasps> okay, and I get that. And Peter's probably like, Jesus, you are ruining the atmosphere once again. Like, do you not understand if you tell people to hate their father and mother and give up all their possessions, nobody is going to follow you. And here is what I wrote. I hope, I hope. Jesus doesn't want a crowd of people who want something from him. He wants fully devoted followers who want some to, to do something for him. There's the difference. If you're this all you do is you, I want this, Jesus, I want that, and you owe, owe this to me. If you're a disciple, you're like, my life is all about you. And here's where I read this. When Jesus died, died on the cross, rose from the grave, before he, uh, he ascended into heaven, he tells his disciples, go wait for the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. Go wait in the upper room. Do you know how many people were in that upper room? A hundred and twenty. That's it. 120 out of 15,000 people where Jesus was healing and doing all these wonderful things, 120 were waiting for the Holy Spirit. That's it. And it showed me then that, that God does not want us, or Jesus does not want us to just be that. Because that is all about me. How can you serve me? We go to church. It's too hot. It's too cold. I want you to do what you want for me. Over here, it's like, Jesus, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do. Because you're the Lord of my life. Uh, now, I want to go back to that part about hating your father and mother because I love my parents, and that would, that's a very difficult saying. I love my children. I love my husband. So for Jesus to come along and say, you need to hate them all. Okay, please understand, he doesn't really mean you, he wants you to hate them. He, here's how I can illustrate this. Micah is one of our sons. When Micah and Shayla got married, they bought a little dog. His name is Puffy. I call him the devil dog because he looks like a devil. I don't even know what the devil looks like, okay? But if, if, if de the devil has a face, it's this dog. But they actually love this dog. It's, it's the love of their life. Until Titus was born, our grandson. And suddenly, their love for Titus eclipsed the love for Puffy. Okay? It's not that they don't still love Puffy and they you know, still feed him and you know, give him water and all those things, but they love Titus more than they do Puffy. And see, that's what happens when you and I become disciples of Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. So please understand that. This is a journey that we're on. And the more we abide in him and the more we spend time with him, the more we realize what he's done for us, then suddenly our love for him grows like it did with Titus. It grows. It doesn't mean I don't love my parents, but my love for Jesus has eclipsed my love for them. It, it, just, it just happens that way. and It's not something I've tried to conjure up. It's just something that happens when you attach yourself to Christ. Uh, possessions. When he says, give up all your possessions. I don't think he really meant give up all your possessions. But I do think that this is what he, he means. If you have possessions and I ask you to give them up at some point in your life, will you do that for me? Are your possessions more important to you than I am? See, that's what this is all about. It's a heart matter. Who's most important? Am I going to be your Lord, or am I just going to be the person who's going to save you? Now, if you are here and you're like, I don't think I could ever do that. 
I don't ever, I don't think I could give up my possessions. And I know I could never love Jesus more than I could love my children or my husband or, or whoever. And this is what I want to ask you. I want you to pray something. And I want, this is what I want you to pray. Jesus, I know you want me to love you more. And, and I know you want me to give everything to you. But I honestly don't feel like I can do that. But would you change me so that I will want to? See, the question is, do you want to want to? Or are you just so hard-hearted that you're like, I would never be that way. And Jesus says, just ask me, and I will change your heart. But you, we have to want to want to do that. Now, here's the other thing. The disciples did not always get it right. So I want to make this very clear. When you and I become a disciple of Christ, it doesn't mean we're going to change like, oh, Jesus, I'm counting the cost and we're, we're good to go. It doesn't work that way. This is a long process. And the disciples, when they followed Jesus, they never got it right at the beginning okay? They, it's so funny. You see John, this scene where, where John is so frustrated with people when he's walking around with Jesus that he asked, actually asked Jesus, I think we should rain down fire on them and kill them all. And Jesus is like, what? Like, who are you? And then you've got Peter, who's always sticking his foot in his mouth. Like, he just never says anything right, and he just says the goofiest things. But then you know what? John the one who wanted to rain down fire at the beginning, wrote the gospel, you know, the gospel of John and first and second and third John. And it was all about love. That, that you will know that you are a follower of Jesus by how you love others, not rain down fire on them. And Peter, Peter, he quit saying goofy things and started being bold in his faith and sharing Jesus with everyone he could meet. Because here's the deal. As we grow closer to Jesus, his heart becomes our heart. That's just what happens. And that's what being a disciple means. Spending time and allowing him to change us. Now, I want to finish out today with a timeline. How are we on time? I can't believe I... Say again. What time is it? 9.50? Okay, we have 10 minutes. Okay, I want to give a real quick timeline on how, gets, how salvation comes about. Because this changed my life when I realized this, I always thought that I was a Christian because I was very, very smart. And I decided one day that I was bright enough to ask Jesus in my heart. And when I realized that that wasn't true, it literally changed my life. So we're going to start really fast. I'm going to throw, show you a couple pictures. Um, we, st we learned this when we did our, uh, seri our ah, Puzzle by the Bible series. Uh, I don't know. Okay, there you go. This is what our life is like when we are born. We are completely separated from God. It's like God is on one side of the bridge. We're on the other. We cannot get to him. We've got some verses, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, which means every person is on that side of the bridge. Romans 5.12, therefore just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. And basically, so basically he's saying that you and I are just born separated from God. So that's our first problem. And then Jesus comes along, and here is what Jesus did. I found this picture. I thought it was kind of cool. It's like God is the top car, and you're the bottom car, and then here comes Jesus. He's pulling in to kind of bridge that gap, okay? So that's kind of a visual on what Jesus did. John 14, 6, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the next verses are something that rocked my absolute world, because I always thought, that, and I was always taught that you just need to ask Jesus in your heart. You do that, you do that, you do that. But what I never realized is what was going on before that. Look at John 6, 44. No one, Jesus says, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 65. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Acts 13, 48, When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And suddenly I saw all these verses I had never even heard of before. And suddenly I saw this pre-me asking Jesus in my heart, and it was all about God was doing something in my life. He was drawing me. He was granting me. He was appointing me. And salvation is all because of him. It has nothing to do with me. Now, if you've been around the church very long, uh, or if not, you will eventually run into it. There's this theological debate out there of Arminianism versus Calvinism. 
Basically, I was an Arminian uh, most of my life. I believe that um, everyone has this free will. You just ask Jesus in your heart. Everyone's on the same page. That's awesome. Uh, I started studying. Somebody invited me to a conference called Chosen by God. Never heard of it in my life before. I suddenly became a Calvinist, and now I'm literally right down the middle because I think the Bible says both. And I used to be so, like I always say, Rob wanted to put me in like a theological mental institute because I felt like I had to have an answer, and I don't, and I never will. I do know that the Bible says both. So if you want to know what the Bible says, this is what I did. I took a green felt pen and a yellow felt pen, and I started in Matthew, and I read Matthew all the way to the end of Revelation. And I yellowed anything that said that, that I saved myself. And I greened out anything that said God saved me. He chose me. He set his love upon me. And I was shocked. Two things. One, that the Bible does say both. But the majority of it says that God, God saved me. And when I realized that, it changed my entire thinking. Instead of being kind of this cocky, God, Jesus is so glad to have, that I'm lucky. he's lucky to have me, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now when I realize this, I'm on my knees in tears saying, God, why would you save me? I don't deserve this. God, why would you do this for me? And suddenly it invokes this humility and this gratitude because I realize salvation is not from me. It's all from him. It's just like Kristen Anderson when she was here with her suicide. Parents will come up and say, why did God save you? But my son or daughter died from suicide. And it makes her cry. She says, I don't know. I, and that's how it should be for us. We should look at salvation and say, I don't know why God saved me, but he did, and I'm not going to let it go to waste. I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be like that because that's what Jesus asks me to do. God saved me. Now, here's the thing is that it takes a lot of pressure off of you and I. If you have people in your family that aren't Christians, you're desperately praying them for them, realize that, that you need to pray for them. God saves people. It's like this. You have a neighbor. You take them to church. They, they don't want to go. You've asked them 90 times to go, and they're like, I don't want to believe in your Jesus. And finally one day they decide to go. And you're so excited, and you get them to church, and suddenly you open the brochure or the, whatever, the pamphlet, whatever the churches have, um, and in there it says, today we have an assistant pastor speaking on tithing. And you're like totally mortified. You're like, You've got to be kidding, like my neighbor finally came. What, what is going on here? And so you're not even looking at him because you're like, I'm too embarrassed that this guy's talking about money. I'm just not even going to look at him. And finally, at the very end, you peek a glance over and you see tears streaming down their eye. And suddenly you realize they want to know Jesus on a, a pastor that isn't even our pastor and he's talking about money, okay? But see, that's the God that we serve. He will use anything to bring people to Jesus. And that's the good part. You don't have to worry about that anymore. I remember Bill Hybels talking about this in his book. He wrote a book, um, and he said he had this guy that he always took fishing on a boat because he wanted him to come to Christ. And he constantly took him fishing and constantly shared Jesus with him. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. One time, Bill couldn't go on this fishing trip. So a bunch of his Christian friends went, never thought anything about it. The guy gets saved on the boat with all his Christian friends. And Bill's like, what the heck? Like, I've just spent my entire life trying to share Jesus and you come to Christ with them and not me? Okay, that's just not right. But look at 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 9. Uh, it's the second verse down there. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos and what is Paul, servants through whom you have believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Isn't that good news? That's really good news for all of us. Because we want to make sure that, so that we understand where salvation is, is from. Now, the next part of the timeline is once we, uh, we, we kind of understand this, God draws us to himself. The next part is John 3.37, and he asks us to do something really weird. Jesus answered and said, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you that unless a person is born again, anew from above, he cannot ever see, know, be acquainted with, and experience the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into his mother's womb again and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, unless a man is born of water and even the spirit, he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. 
what is born of the flesh is flesh, of physical is physical, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, do not be surprised, astonished at my telling you, you must be born anew. See, you and I are born physically, but Jesus comes along and said, if you want to be this, you need to be born again spiritually. And, and Romans 10, 13 tells us how to do it. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. John 1, 12, but as many as did receive him, he gave the authority to become children of God. And then the most amazing thing happens when you become born again. And it's this next verse in Colossians. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control of the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption. Think about this. I, made this, I had this picture of this. Think about that. You and I, we, we lived in this whole realm of darkness. And God says, I'm opening this door of light and I'm transferring you into the light. And that's what happens when you and I become a Christian. See, salvation is a really, really, really big deal. It's like if I came in here today and I looked, I, I had broken bones and my hair's all matted and I'm just a mess and I walk in and I said, I'm so sorry. But this morning I was taking my garbage out to my, our dumpster right as the garbage man's showing up, but he didn't see me and he ran me over. And then he didn't see me as he was backing out and he ran me over again. Okay, I'm so sorry. I should be in the hospital, but here I am because I just can't miss Bible study, okay? But here's my point. That's what salvation's like. Something really big took place in your life when you become born again and you become a disciple. It's not like, it's like you went from darkness to light and you went from unforgiveness to forgiveness and you went from an eternity in hell to an eternity in heaven. Like that's a really, really big deal. And see, here's the deal. We saw that the disciples that followed him, they didn't just go, yay, Jesus came in my life, that's super awesome. Every single thing changed in their life when they came to Christ. Do I have two minutes left? How many minutes? Two. Ah, I have a one-minute YouTube video, kind of cute. Hey, can we roll that really quick? This is what I look of salvation. Look at this bear. He saves a crow. I don't know if you ever saw this. He's at a zoo. Look at the little crow down there. He's freaking out because he can't. I don't know if you can see that. He's like, help, help. And see, this is how I look at salvation. That's us. We're going, help, I can't, I can't get, get to like eternity. I need someone to save me. And the bear grabs him. Look at this. Hey, you're safe. What the bird does, he's like, oh. <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> Why didn't he just eat me? <laughs> Look how cute he shakes himself off. Hey, now he sits this up upright and he says, this is what I say, let's get busy. It's time to go do something for Jesus. Now that we got saved like that little crow, Jesus saves us just like that. And now we have a choice. Let's dry off and let's get going as far as being a disciple of Jesus. And here's how I want to end today. When Rob and I were in a, uh, it was Valentine's Day and we ended up in a, in a, Ah, a coffee shop, and they had all these Valentine's cards on there. And I found this Valentine card, which I made one to look like it. My heart was forever changed the day I met you, and I have never been the same since. And I know that's for your husband or boyfriend or whatever. But it dawned on me when I read it that that is what salvation does. My heart was forever changed the day I met you, Jesus, and I have never been the same since. That's salvation. And I can't make it any better. It's not this goofiness over here that says, oh yeah, I'm going to just be tolerant and do whatever I want to do. It's this. It's saying it's the 120, not the 15,000 that say, I want to be a disciple of yours and follow you, which means, Jesus, you are going to be my Lord. And I am going to unfollow me and I'm going to follow you. And you know what? You're going to be my boss of everything. They had a spiritual birth. So we're going to end with how we always do. Look at your own life and say, what am I? Do I look more like this, sitting there, look like a Christian, but nothing's going on inside, or am I this? 
I'm, I'm taken off. I'm filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, and my life has been forever changed. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us what it means to be a true disciple of yours because, God, I know that I would never know for sure that I was yours and eternity was mine if I didn't understand this concept, that I can know for sure if, in fact, I'm a disciple of yours. God, I pray for anyone here, anyone watching that says, you know what, I think I'm the Christian, I don't think I'm the disciple. I pray that today will be the day that they look within themselves and say, I want to count the cost and I want to become a follower of Jesus and be transferred from the darkness into the light. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us so we can spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just to say, God, I'm adding you into my equation. I'm adding you into this problem. And when I, God had a purpose for his pit, just like he has a purpose for your pit that you're into, he's not going to let you down. When you believe the Bible and the Bible alone, I said, that's what we do. Suddenly, one day, you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, I don't really have animosity towards that person anymore. But I promise you that I think today you'll be really, really encouraged at the very end because I learned something I never even thought of.